All right, I think we should just get started. Um, thanks everyone for being here today. I have here um Edward, uh, who's one of the software engineers, um, and founding engineers um at Insco. And my name is Richard. I'm one of the product managers here. Um, and we'll be talking about Ray Turbo today. This is one of our newly announced proprietary runtime for Ray workloads, uh, exclusively available on any scale. So let's get started. Um, I'm gonna set some context. You might be familiar with the stack already. Um, this is what we typically show as the Ray stack. Um, and if you're familiar with Ray, it has a suite of AI libraries, um, including Ray data for unstructured data processing, uh, Ray train for distributed training at scale, and Ray serve for flexible and scalable model serving. So this is, um, this is some of the libraries that are available, um, and all of these libraries are built on top of Ray Core. Together, these compose the open source Ray package, and this entire Ray stack runs on any scale, which manages infrastructure and uh, underlying machines on any cloud. Now, if you're working on the, from the open source, you might be familiar with the bottom part of the stack, um, looking like uh, you know GKE or EKS or even just EC2, and so on and so forth. Now, um, now that we have some familiarity with the stack, um, what, what we're going to talk about today is about Ray Turbo. So Ray Turbo aims to provide the best price performance and developer capabilities for AI workloads compared with other solutions um, of running Ray, including running Ray in the open source on um, an open source Kubernetes cluster. So Ray Turbo is a pretty broad categorization, but it's primarily focused on four broad workloads um, in the AI development lifecycle. So um, data, so there is a Ray Turbo data that we'll be talking about. Training, uh, so the equivalent would be Ray Turbo train. Serving and LLMs. You might notice that LLMs kind of stands out in particular, but the, the main thing to emphasize is that we have a suite of LLM uh, enabled uh, features, or sorry, features to enable uh, working with LLMs, uh, whether it be, um, you know, inferencing or training. And the, this sort of suite is built on top of Ray and available exclusively on any scale as well. So now I'm going to deep dive into these sort of workloads and what Ray Turbo has to offer for, for each particular component. Um, so for Ray Turbo data, there's a variety of features that we announced um, over the last couple of weeks, and we are going to be continuing pushing on this over the next quarters. So for example, um, one of the key features that we, we showcased that the keynote was accelerated metadata fetching. So um, Ray Turbo uh, in, has, has included a couple of these optimizations for read intensive data workloads. Um, so you might imagine something like being able, ingesting data from cloud storage to feed into training. This is something that is fairly narrow in terms of data processing workloads, but is hugely dependent um, on how fast you can read. And what we see on RAID Turbo data is a up to 4.5x speed up on time to first output um, from the reading compared to open source Ray. Uh, resumable jobs is also something that we we've, um, we've been working on, and effectively this allows radiator jobs to be checkpointed, stopped, or resumed. Now, um, this can happen within the stage. So, for example, if your if your uh, pipeline only has like three stages where you read, um, do some batch inference, and you write, um, resumable jobs allows you to be able to checkpoint intermediate progress in the batch inference stage um, and and then sort of uh, uh, re resume it upon um, after 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 it fails. So this is useful for situations where you have like uh, cluster head node failures, you're doing batch inference and there are some edge cases that you run into and it fails the entire job. And, uh, and the goal here is to minimize the amount of ways to work. Streaming aggregation is one of the other features that we have in Ray Turbo data. So this implements um, 
data aggregation steps within the same key in a streaming way. So um, this is especially useful for video batch inference um, and and is, is leveraged by um, companies that, that care about sort of being able to do advanced data processing on their videos. Improved law scaling, this is in comparison to open source, um, is a lot of enhancements and, and uh, stability issue fixes um, for clusters and auto, uh, actor pools for auto scaling. Um, this enables users not to need to wait for their entire uh, large cluster to launch in order to run the data processing jobs, um, which allows you know jobs to scale up and scale down and continue even under node preemption. And finally, the, the last feature I want to showcase for RAID Turbo Data um, is on audio and video readers, which provide uh, you know, purpose-built uh, connector modules for efficiently loading and decoding video and audio data. So that's the first section on RAID Turbo Data. Um, the, the next section I want to talk about is training. So RAID Turbo Train also has a couple select features um, that we want to highlight as part of this RAID Turbo release. Uh, distributed elastic training is one of the key sort of headline features for a training on top of any skill, which allows training to resume even under hard hardware failure. Um, it enables running these training workloads on spot instances uh, with minimal interruption, which can thereby reduce training costs significantly. Uh, one of the things that this one of the interesting things about Ray Turbo Train is that um, with elastic training paired with the underlying uh, infrastructure improvements. Um, our underlying AnyScale infrastructure also enables spot, um, spot fallback to on-demand and sort of a prioritization between different node groups. Um, th so the, the sort of full stack approach to, to looking at Elastic Training allows for uh, much better SLAs uh, in terms of training times. Improved training observability is also something that we've been working on very closely with our customers. Um, training oftentimes is cited as a, a workload that is very iterative and very experimental. And therefore workloads um, such as this require really good observability in, in addition to existing tooling for experiment management and experiment tracking. Um, so what we've done is we spent a lot of time um, building a, a UI and user experience uh, around dashboarding and being able to debug distributed training workloads, which is often a very big pain when coming from the open source. Um, so this dashboard um, provides insight into individual worker progresses and is built to help pinpoint stragglers and eliminate bottlenecks within the training system. Um, again, similar to, to previous features, we're going to be continuing to extend the feature set on this particular um, Ray Turbo library, and there will be more announcements to come. Finally, Ray Serve. Um, has an equivalent uh, Ray Turbo Serve and has a variety of features um, for for optimized uh, model serving. Um, one of the things that we showcased at, at the summit um, was fast facile scaling and model loading. So typically, um, loading a 70 billion parameter model or a 400 b parameter model um, can be very expensive and very costly and very time consuming. And it's very hard to auto scale and uh, sort of match um, underlying cluster response, uh, or underlying sort of um, uh, request rate responses. And so um, what we've done across our stack and and even within like the model loading section is we've we've improved auto scaling and cluster start capabilities um, through clever engineering on our infrastructure side. And now like in comparison to open source Kubray, end-to-end uh, -end scaling time for, for example, like a 7 dB parameter model can be up to five times faster on any scale. And what, what we've done here in particular, and we'll showcase in the next slide, is we've done a lot of work also on uh, the streaming, um, sort of streaming implementation of being able to load weights um, from cloud storage, and therefore that that is, contributes significantly to, to the improved runtime. Uh, Edward will be demonstrating a little bit um, uh, about these functionalities in, in a later session. Um, so uh, we've also sort of done work around um, high QPS optimizations where we have a version of uh, Rayserve that is optimized and, and has sort of uh, 
parts of that are re-implemented in 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 higher higher performance uh, components. Um, and so what we've done, what we've seen is that we can sort of observe up to higher, like fifty percent higher uh, QPS under the same SLA uh, without sort of um, incurring extra costs and so on and so forth. Um, and in terms of streaming use, use cases, we also see up to three times higher um, streaming tokens per second for high traffic serving use cases, for example, for LLMs. Um, we have zero, zero downtime incremental rollouts, which um, allows for incremental rollouts and canary upgrades uh, without requiring like a blue-green deployment. Um, uh, so, so especially this is in comparison to a lot of open source tooling where um, you now do not require like 2x the hardware capacity um, in order to do it to upgrade. Um, it also includes uh, rollback procedures, obviously, um, so that you can sort of up upgrade your de uh, cluster deployments without extra costs and um, in a safe manner. Uh, so th the sort of incremental rollout stuff is particularly important if you have a fixed cluster size. Um, for example, if you reserve instances ahead of time. Um, now, replica compaction is something that we've also invested in. This is when you have to downscale and you're seeing traffic decrease and you have replicas that are being deleted uh, across various nodes. Uh, what you don't want is a, a sort of a fragmented cluster where your all of your cluster nodes are low utilization and you have the opportunity to compact um, the, the the actors, but you're unable to. So replica compaction migrates these replicas um, into free, fewer nodes if when possible, reducing resource fragmentation and improving hardware utilization, there, thereby reducing costs. Uh, containerized runtime environments is something that we've also uh, spent time working on. So allowing the configuration of different container images uh, for different race server deployments. Um, this includes sort of fast container optimizations and improves the security posture of um, of doing these containers containerized or runtime environments compared to, for example, open source racer. And finally, you can deploy um, racer on any scale across multiple availability zones. Um, so we do have the ability to be a availability zone aware when we do the scheduling of the replicas, thereby re uh, providing higher redundancy to, to availability zone failures. Um, so about fast model loading, I want to sort of deep dive a little bit more into this. Um, at any scale, we've optimized uh, scale up speeds across the stack, leading to uh, major auto scaling speed ups for a variety of models. For example, we have here an example of a small model, a 7B model, and also a larger model, a 7DB model on the AnyScale platform when compared to running the same application using Kubray on Amazon EKS, Elastic Kubernetes Service. Um, in addition, in particular, uh, AnyScale does provide a library, as I mentioned earlier, for, for model, fast model loading, streaming tensors directly from cloud storage onto the GPU. And the graph shown here compares open source BLM defaults with any scale fast model loading, which shows up to a 5x speed up for large models. Again, Edward will be doing a, a live demo of this in a couple minutes, so, so we can stay tuned for that. Um, next, I'm going to showcase some of the LLM features that we have on any scale and some of the exciting announcements that we've made around there. We do have an LLM suite in Ray Turbo, and this consists of three major components with seamless integration between them. Um, through our model registry and data sets features to complete the end-to-end -end LLM development cycle. First, LLM Forge is one of the most comprehensive LLM refinement libraries available today with extensive breadth of uh, fine-tuning techniques, including causal language modeling, instruction tuning, con continued pre-training, and also standard um, lower-based fine-tuning. We have a new uh, batch inference library called Ray LLM Batch. This is a library that's built purposely for optimizing and executing batch LLM inference pipelines at scale. Cost improvements with Ray LLM Batch can be up to 6x when compared to other inference providers such as AWS Bedrock and OpenAI without requiring high-end hardware uh, like A100s or H100s. And finally, we have RayLM, which is for serving. 
Um, it offers high performance and fully configurable online serving for any open sourced large language model, as well as multimodal models. Featuring support such as Lora multiplexing, JSON mode or constraint decoding, and also uh, custom performance tuning. I'm going to deep dive a little bit into uh, the batch LM inference work that we've been doing. Um, so for self-hosted inference, Ray and AnyScale offer unique advantages when it comes to batch LM inference. Um, batch LM inference on AnyScale will use key components of our stack, including um, the AnyScale proprietary inference engine, uh, AnyScale Ray Turbo Data, Ray Core, and the AnyScale platform. Um, in particular for the the inference engine, which wasn't really mentioned in previous slides, um, it's heavily based on VLM, and we've done some extra extensions to optimize uh, kernels um, and, and various other in integration steps. Um, it, in particular, we've also been working very closely with the VLM team to, to make sure there are um, other optimizations that are going in uh, on the open source side um, and contributing some of these optimizations ourselves. Um, in certain cases, uh, Ray LM batch is able to reduce costs up to 2.9x compared to AWS Bedrock and OpenAI and up to 6x in shared prefix situations um, simply by optimizing and configuring the batch inference workload much more effectively. So as an example, we have an experiment here. Um, so in this experiment shown, we evaluate Ray LM batch on any scale on a 8B parameter model, Llama 3.1 AP, and compare it to common alternative solutions. So this includes Bedrock, Bedrock with batch pricing, and OpenAI GPT-40 Mini with batch pricing. We evaluate the solution, solution using a data set uh, with requests of 2,000 input, 100 output shapes with no shared prefix first, um, which is a common sh request shape for uh, summarization. So we see that in this particular workload, compared to alternatives, um, the Anyscale uh, BF16 uh, solution is around 2x cheaper than the Bedrock batch solution. The Anyscale FB8 solution is up to nearly 3x cheaper than the Amazon AWS Bedrock batch pricing solution. And if you assume a shared prefix, we can see that the Anyscale um, solution for this workload comes out to be 6x cheaper than the AWS batch pricing solution and up to oh, nearly 5x cheaper um, than the OpenAI for GPT-40 mini uh, batch pricing solution. So um, so we're going to be continuing working on uh, batch inference and and uh, optimizing costs and so, so on and so forth here. Um, what we're going to be focused on next is on multimodal models. So if you, that's something that you're interested in, we'd love to get in contact. Um, overall, this is sort of concludes the section on Ray Turbo as an overview. And I believe, Edward, you can probably take it next to sort of um, talk about uh, fast model loading uh, and demonstrate some of those capabilities there. Cool. Uh, there are a couple of questions they may want to take from the Q&A. All right. Oh, okay. So I can go ahead and take a look at that right now. Um, so yeah. So uh, Sahil asks, will this recorded presentation be available online? Um, I believe it should be. Um, yeah. And second, Anonymous says, are the Ray Turbo capabilities like data and serve available for any scale on Kubernetes for customer owned data centers? Uh, yes, they should be. Um, uh, Mahidar uh, says, what are some of the use cases for batch inference? Um, there's actually a lot of different use cases for batch inference. For example, say um, summarization, um, user ticket classification, um, sentiment analysis, uh, content understanding. Like if you want to, if you have a large corpus of like, uh, you know, images that, that users are uploading, being able to sort of classify them at scale obviously is is something that doesn't have ha, need to happen in real time um uh, what are some of the kernel level optimizations that need to be done for VLM and otherwise batch inference so that's something some of the work that we've done in-house and in particular um 
we've sort of you know a lot of the kernels are built for uh whether it be like low latency or just overall like token like overall um uh, like matrix multiply throughput and um in certain situations you can multiplex the resources more effectively so so being able to leverage compute bandwidth uh or yeah compute capacity memory bandwidth and network bandwidth more effectively that that's something that we've we've done in house um how well or tightly would you say a uh, rate terrible connects with uh pytorch hugging face and machine learning ecosystem so the apis that rate terrible offers are um for the large part the same as the open source ray capabilities and so um open source ray is built with these sort of integrations with PyTorch tracking face and MLflow in mind. Um so so it should just work work as well as what you get in the open source. Cool. Okay. Um I think that's all the questions for now. So I'll take over and work and talk about the fast model later. Uh, can you confirm you can see the presentation, Richard? Yeah. Okay, um, cool. So thanks so much, Richard. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit more in detail about one of the optimizations that Richard mentioned, which was the fast model loading work. Um, <clears throat> so Richard talked about this a little bit in the presentation, but with the rise of LLMs and generative AI in general, um, it's become you know this, this trend that models are, have just gotten absolutely huge. So a 7B model is, you know, basically what's considered small now. Um, but in, in FP16, um, a 7B model is 14 gigabytes of weights. And that means you need to fetch this from some kind of remote storage and then load it onto the GPU before you can even start, um, before you can even start serving requests. A 7DB model, which is really common among our users and customers, is 10 times larger at like 140 gigabytes. And 405B models are um, starting to become popular, and this is almost a terabyte. Uh, so this is just a, a really big obstacle, and I'm sure a lot of people have experienced the pain of waiting for these uh, weights to download and load before you can um, test things out in development or uh, serve in production. So uh, a lot of people are familiar with this classic XKCD comic. Uh, you know, you have two developers, and they're sitting around waiting for their code to compile. But I think we need to update it for the, the modern uh, AI practitioner. And now what we're doing is the same old thing, but uh, just waiting for a model to load instead. And this really has uh, pretty serious consequences. So in, in development, um, slow scaling drains productivity. Um, anytime that you need to wait minutes and minutes for uh, things to, to spin up, um, it's just a waste of your time. And in production, uh, this can also this can often lead to over provisioning, because if you can't respond uh, to you know increased user traffic by upscaling quickly, then you need to over provision and have extra uh, resources in steady state. And this is especially problematic when you're using GPUs to serve models. Um, it's very very expensive to have them sitting around idle. So let's talk about what uh, kind of a baseline solution looks like for loading these large model weights. Um, so this is sort of the standard thing that we see our customers and, and open source users use, which is um, first you'll download the weights from something like an S3 bucket. Um, and for this, you might use the, the AWS S3 CP CLI, um, which is pretty well tuned for, for high throughput. And then after you download from S3 onto local disk, um, you use a library like Safe Tensors, which is able to, uh, you know, efficiently load from local disk onto the GPU. Um, so that setup looks something like what I have in the diagram on the right. But this has a couple of problems. Um, the main one is that you have these three synchronous load steps. So you first need to download from the S3 bucket and write to the local disk. You wait for that to finish, and then you load from the local disk into CPU memory. And then once again, you load from CPU memory into GPU memory. When the weights get really large, each of these stages can take quite a while. Um, so this end-to-end -end process becomes quite slow. So AnyScale offers a safe tensors compatible client um, that allows you to directly load from remote storage, like an S3 or a Google Cloud storage bucket, 
And um, here you can see that we can pass that, that remote URI and then load directly onto a GPU. The difference under the hood is that AnyScale will do this in a streaming fashion and basically take advantage of pipeline parallelism. So um, instead of downloading the entire file and then loading it to the GPU, we'll fetch the, the model tensors chunk by chunk and then stream it onto the GPU as they're ready. And this makes a, a pretty big difference in end-to-end -end download times, um, which I will show in a quick demo. Uh, OK, so here I have a workspace on um, AnyScale running. Uh, so this is just running a, um, uh, that's not too important, actually. We can take a look at the dashboard, and you can see that there's uh, just one node in my cluster, and this is a GPU node. It's an A10G, so I'm running on a, um, a G5 instance on AWS. And there's nothing running on it right now. Um, but I have some model weights stored in an S3 bucket. So we can take a look at that. Uh, oops, I forgot the LS. So we have a bunch of stuff in this bucket, um, but you can see I have a copy of Mistral 7B that's stored in safe tensors format. And this is the total size in bytes, so it's about um, 14 gigabytes. So I have a first script here, um, which is <clears throat> essentially implementing the, the baseline solution that I showed on the slide. So it takes the, the remote model path, and then it uses the AWS S3 CP command to copy it to local disk. And then once that's done, it uses the safe tensors load file um, command to load it onto the GPU. And I also have uh, the AWS S3 CLI tuned to give us like the maximum throughput that it can. <clears throat> so if we download this, you can see it starts by downloading the model from S3. And this is fairly fast. It's able to um, download pretty quickly. I think in most of my testing, it takes maybe like 30 seconds or so to download the model. Uh, let's see. So it's hovering like a little bit under uh, about half, half a gigabyte to one gigabyte per second. It took about 25 seconds to download to local disk. And then it took another three seconds to load from disk into memory. So in total, it was just under 30 seconds. Um, so not too bad, but if you uh, use a 70 dB model, this would be you know almost 10 times as long. And in production, waiting 30 seconds for your model to load is already you know a pretty big problem. So let's take a look at the AnyScale version, which I have in this script called uh, fast.py. So it looks pretty similar, uh, but the difference is that we're using this AnyScale version of the load file command. And we're directly passing the remote URI in here. Um, and then we're telling it that we want to load uh, these weights onto the GPU. So let's try running this one now. And remember, this is going to do the download and stream to the GPU all at once. So when this uh, command finishes, it will already be loaded onto the GPU. And just like that, it finished. So it finished in about uh, just under 9 seconds versus almost 30 for the baseline. And if we take a look over here, we can see that uh, the entire 14 gigabyte model is already loaded onto the GPU. So this is a, a pretty significant speed up just for the 7B, 7B model. Um, you can imagine if you're using a 70B or a, in, uh, you know even larger model that it would be even more dramatic. And so the other thing I want to show is that on, um, so on any scale, we have Ray LLM, which makes it really easy to deploy LLMs as you know production services. So here I have um, a config file for deploying Mistral 7B. Uh, and inside of here, I've, I've configured it by passing that same um, model path to use fast loading uh, when I'm using Ray LLM. So between any scales optimizations on node startup and container pulling and this fast model loading, um, for a production service, we should be able to spin up new copies of the model really fast. So here is the, the service um, I just showed the config for. And I have it running. I started it um, just before the, the webinar began. And you can see I have the Mistral 7B instruct deployment. 
Uh, but it currently has zero replicas. So it's scaled all the way down to zero and um, there are no copies of the model ready to serve. If we take a look at the cluster, we can see that uh, there's only a single node and there's no GPU at all. This is only the head node. Um, so what I'm going to do next is uh, send a query to my service, which is going to need to spin up a new copy of the model uh, in order to service it. So this is going to start a new node with a GPU on it. It's going to pull the pretty large container images with all of my dependencies like VLM and PyTorch. And then it's going to load the 14 gigabytes of model weights. Um, and we should be able to do all of this relatively quickly. Um, so I need to give it a prompt. What is the weather like in San Francisco in October? So this query is not going to return immediately because um, we didn't have any replicas running. But if I return over here, we should see um, uh, here, this is the event log for the service. And you can see here that the request came in. So uh, we're now upscaling from 0 to 1 replicas. Uh, and the AnyScale Autoscaler has launched uh, a G6.8x large instance. So this has a, an NVIDIA L4 GPU on it. Um, and if we go back up to the top, we can see that that deployment that had zero replicas now says that it's upscaling from zero to one. Uh, so it looks like the node was uh, already booted and added to the cluster. So that took uh, around 30 seconds. So now we should be waiting for the container image to get pulled, um, which should be relatively fast as well. I think if we go over to this log page, we should be able to see it. Let's see. Um, oh, OK. Uh, this was this didn't print one of the logs that I expected. But actually, the upscaling has already finished end to end. You can see we got this message, deployment upscaling completed. And if we go back, we can see that um, the, the query returned. So it says, in October, San Francisco typically experiences mild, damp weather. Uh, and remember, this when I sent this query, there was nothing running at all. No machine, no container, and no model loaded. And end to end, we were able to uh, scale it up in, uh, looks like, about 45 seconds. Um, so running the comparable setup on Cubray in our testing takes over five minutes. So this is like a, more than a five times improvement. Um, cool. OK, so that concludes the demo portion. Looks like we have a couple of uh, questions in the chat that I can answer now. And if anyone help, else has any questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, OK, so Ray Turbo is VM only like any skill platform. Or it is going to support GKE as well and be able to offer this. Uh, yeah, so good question. So AnyScale actually recently launched support for running the AnyScale platform on Kubernetes, including GKE. Uh, and all of the Ray Turbo features, yeah, I, I believe all of the features that Richard mentioned in the presentation are also supported on um, AnyScale on Kubernetes. And then Wei Lu says, how to set up the config file for serving, any best practices? Um, so actually, let me just do like a impromptu live demo here. So on any scale, there's actually something really cool. So if you use like Ray LLM, you can use this gen config command. Um, and you know, there are a ton of knobs that you need to tune. Oh, I have my I have my environment messed up, so I, I won't be able to show it. But there are a ton of knobs that you need to tune for um, for things like uh, like VLM. There are just like a lot of different configurations. And with Ray LLM on any scale, we try to like configure a lot of them out of the box for you, so that you don't need to worry about it. And then Ray LLM exposes like kind of only a subset of that, so that really helps with you know getting good performance out of the box. And then we have a bunch of tutorials and documentation for um, how to configure things beyond that. Um, OK, how different it is from some of the fast model loading optimization that NVIDIA is doing with TensorRT and NIMS platform. Any benchmarks available? Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with NIMS. Um, and as far as I know, 
the NVIDIA model loading that I've seen in TensorRT is only from local disk, uh, but I, I might be, I might have missed something. Um, so the main difference is this ability to load from remote storage, um, but don't quote me on this because I, I, my knowledge might be out of date. The other thing is that this client that I showed um, is not really specific to like Ray LM or VLM. It can be used with any torch model. Um, so it's very general purpose. Um, am I able to use an on-prem infra to help serve predictions with Ray Turbo? Uh, so if you use any scale, we do have support for something called machine pools where you can connect um, like some on-prem instances and be able to use them with the AnyScale platform. And in that case, you would be able to use it with Ray Turbo. And does Ray Turbo use any specific tools like Carpenter or some other tool for scheduling the nodes? Um, no, so uh, AnyScale has basically a, a full custom control plane that, that handles the scheduling. Um, so even when you're running on top of Kubernetes, it will talk back to the, the AnyScale control plane, including the autoscaler in order to decide what node types need to be added and then do the scheduling. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks so much everyone for participating today. That's all the questions that we have right now. Um, we can wait another 30 seconds or, or one minute. Oh, there's another question from Brian Dennis. I can... uh, yeah, just to be clear, Ray Turbo is only within any scale platform. There's no open source slash self-hosted version. Yeah, that's right. So currently Ray Turbo is only available um, if you use it with the any scale platform. Well, well, on the self-hosted, I think the clarification there is it will run in your control plane. Um, or sorry, it will run in your data plane. So like the, you know, the machines and the infrastructure um, can be configured to your liking. But there will not be an open source Pressure. Edward, do you want to press done on the the questions that you've answered? Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry, I didn't realize I could do that. Okay. All right. Um, with that, I think we're basically done. Um, uh, thanks everyone for attending and uh, appreciate the audience. Um, if you have any questions, please please feel free to follow up with the AnyScale folks. Um, or like, you know, contact us through the, the website. And um, well, I guess there's one last question. So Sundeep asks, how, how are we keeping up to date with VLM support stack and support Ray LLM? Um, well, uh, so essentially, if I understand correctly, it's like, how do we sort of make sure our LLM stack is sort of receiving the best um sort of improvements from the open source. Um, so Ray LLM is sort of at a lower layer than, or a different layer than VLM, so they don't interact. And uh, and VLM is, uh, uh, like we do sort of have our proprietary inference engine that that is closely maintained with the upstream. So we try to sync it every, every week or so. So it's like the plan will be to, sort of continue maintaining it. And in terms of its interactions with Ray LM, that shouldn't be a problem since the interfaces we leverage there are pretty stable. Great. Cool. Okay. I th oh, were there any talks on Ray Summit at Ray Summit on Ray Turbo? Um, so there were a couple of there wasn't one specific talk um, on Ray Turbo. There were a variety of different talks that covered topics that we covered. Um, so for example, Edward gave a talk on Ray Serve, um, which covered a lot of the batch, uh, the, the, sorry, not the batch inference, the um, the serving work that, then the model loading work that he just showed. And I gave a talk on batch inference, which goes into much more detail on like the batch inference optimizations we've done. Um, I believe there was also some some talks on rate, like LM suites and like the LM capabilities in on any scale. So those were, yeah, there were. I think you had to dig a little bit, but they were definitely there. All right. Okay, we're gonna call it, and um, thank you, everyone. Thank you.